there. It's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball podcast, where we sometimes discuss camel fighting, dodo birds, leaky black. Matt Norlander is here with me. If you're watching on YouTube, you know what to do to that like button. Shouts to Brandon Davies. And if you haven't yet subscribed to the CBS Sports College Basketball YouTube channel, please also do that while you're here. Let's get into it. Today, we are wrapping up our summer shoot around series with an auction episode. In simple terms, what we have done in the past, what we did here is auction off an episode to the highest bidder who gets to choose the team they want us to preview. And Norlander, why don't you do the honors this year? Can you tell the audience who we're discussing for our auction episode today? <laughs> I can. Uh, thanks, everyone, for tuning in. Obviously, if you're listening right here at the start, you are unaware. Uh, well, actually, only a few people to this point know what the school is. It's a school that made the NCAA tournament last season. By the way, we've done some in the past where I've gone in not knowing. Uh, but here's your for first tip here. I did request from Nada that if it was going to be a mid-major, I wanted to do proper uh, research as opposed to the high major. So it's a mid-major program. Made the tournament last season has only four NCAA tournament appearances to its name at the Division I level, named after a human being, has been playing Division I ball only since 1976, which I found surprising, has a new coach, program, school's been doing amazing across the board as of late. We are going deep on not just a school, but I have a hunch. I have a hunch that Gary Parrish may have spent upward of 30 minutes on Wikipedia researching the man this university is named after. We are going deep on James Madison University. It is James Madison University. The Dukes were awesome last season. As you know, they played 36 games, 132 of them, 15 and three in the Sun Belt. Finished second in the conference standings, one game back of Appalachian State, won the Sun Belt tournament, got the auto bid, 12 seed in the NCAA tournament. Beat Wisconsin and then lost to Duke 93-55 in the round of 32. Incredible season, unsurprisingly, because it's just kind of thing that happens when you're uh, at this level and you have an incredible season. Uh, it cost them their coach. Mark Byington is now at Vanderbilt. And the new coach is Preston Spradlin, 37-year-old from Kentucky, who was previously the head coach at Moorhead State. For what it's worth, BartPorvik.com has James Madison projected I, to finish. I didn't look. I knew you were going to do I didn't look. Let me guess. Okay. Let me guess here. And by the way, shouts to the JMU faithful who made this happen. We're going to make this. If you are if you were hoping for some sort of high major, uh, -uh stick around. I promise you <laughs> this episode will be worth it because who the hell knows where we're going on this. And I talked with Preston Spradlin ahead of uh, doing this episode. So I got some insight intel. You're going to get some little scoopage here on the, on the program and the schedule. Um, I knew you'd look where they were. I didn't look. Uh, Preston Spradlin did tell me. I think we got to get to a break, by the way, early on in this episode. We'll get there. Uh, he did tell me that they are expected to do well in the conference, and he learned that quickly because he had a hard time scheduling high majors. So mm. I'm going to guess uh, this is now a Sun Belt program, oh, by the way. I'm going to say 144 preseason at Torvik. Okay. I had – That's third, a blind guess. I had it third in the Sun Belt. Okay. I didn't look up the exact number uh, in terms of the country, but I can do that really quickly. Okay. We'll learn it together. It's going to be 123, 123rd in the country, third in the Sun Belt. Is that is that a reasonable projection by a computer, or is that disrespectful to Preston Spradlin and all that he stands for? I'm going to make Norlander answer that question next, but first, let's get a word from our partners. A Quiet Place Day 1 is now streaming. Paramount Plus. It's thrilling, terrifying. It will make your heart pound out of your chest. A Quiet Place Day One, now streaming. Okay, Norlander. Mm -hmm. Torvik's got James Madison picked third in the Sun Belt behind Arkansas State and Troy. Reasonable? Ooh. Or, or disrespectful to Preston Spradlin and everything that he stands for. Uh, and that might. Uh, hold on a second. If I isn't App State also in the Sun Belt here? That might be disrespectful to Dustin Kearns. Appalachian <laughs> State is picked fifth in the Sun Belt. Wow. 155th in the country, according to BartTorvik.com. 
How about that? Uh, that's a 27 win program a year ago there. Uh, for JMU, that's 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 optimistic. In fact, uh, the winning uh, bidder here, give him a shout, Jeff Smith. He did send a few questions in. We'll get to those before the end of the episode here. And expectations therein, what should be deemed a success. It's one of the questions, so we'll also dive into that. I think that is a bit rosy. GP, as you know, after diving in, and did you did you dive in more on the team or James Madison, the former president? Out of curiosity, you know me. Yeah. <laughs> I don't. I took a deep dive on both. Yeah, I can tell you who they lost, who they got. I can give you Preston Spradlin's bio. I know quite a bit about the Dukes, but I know probably even more about James Madison, the man. The fourth president of the United States of okay, America. Okay, now here, I was going to trivia time you on that. Yeah, this is a bad day if you be trivia time with me on well, James Madison, Well, I knew buddy. you'd look it up. Now, hold on. Scout's honor. Did you know that James Madison was the fourth president before the Wikipedia research? No, I knew he was one of them. Okay. I know Can Barack's 44. Trivia time. I know here Barack's 44. Here we go. Yeah, now trivia time. No, man, you're not going to make I, me look I, like an I idiot. Give you, I can give you one through five. <laughs> Okay. Give me one through five, United States no presidents. Way. I know you no got chance. one. I know I you got not, number one. Nah, you know, I I don't know if you watch presidential debates too often, but sometimes I do. And one of the things I always wonder about is like, yo, you didn't have to say that and make yourself look stupid. Why did you say that and make yourself look like what? a lunatic? There were no presidential debates on television when uh, when good old James Madison was was running for office. So lucky for him, I mean, he'd have had some questions to answer. Speaking of uh, speaking <laughs> of debates and deflections, you're deflecting right now. Can you get me? No, I don't know anything. You can. Who's the first president of the United States? Come on, <laughs> President George. Yes, Washington. There you go. Yeah. Come on, what was your confidence level on that? You got to be better than this. Oh, I I was very confident about George okay. Washington. Can you give me two? No. Wow. <laughs> I, don't, I know Barack was 44. Okay. Start counting backwards. We we know 46. We know 45. We know 44. We know 43. Yeah, let's see if I can name the last five. You I think you can name I think you can name the last eight. Okay, let's see. It. Right now, starting right now. Don't Go worry, backwards. James Madison basketball fan. We're going to get to your team eventually. If you think that, that this episode was going to be all about the basketball team. No. Sorry, I apologize, but that's not Can the way we get do things around here. I, actually, I have full confidence you will get to our eight most recent presidents. President Biden. Okay. President Trump. Yep. President Obama. Yep. President Bush. There we go. You're halfway there. President Clinton. Yep. Was President Bush right before President Clinton? You need yeah. to say it in the form of a uh, statement, not a question. President Bush. First President Bush. That's correct. Need two more? Yeah. First President Bush came on the heels of, oh, that was Ronald Reagan. That's correct. Who, okay. who preceded Reagan? Jimmy Carter. There you go. You did it. You did it. Man, look at me. I should be teaching history classes somewhere. Who, who preceded Jimmy Carter? Oh, man. that's <laughs> Gerald that, Ford. Was that? Gerald Ford. Gerald Ford, of course. And are. I know Nixon was in there somewhere. Yeah, let's see. Look at you. We had we a Lyndon got, Johnson. Got what? We had a Lyndon Johnson and we had a JFK. Yeah. And we might have been on the verge of having an RFK, but you can look that up for yourself. Here are your first eight presidents in order. Okay. George Washington. I could have given you George Washington, John Adams, Tom. I knew Stratton. John Adams because yeah, he was also well, a hold on. He went he on to have the, a the college they, they, officiating they career. for a loop, though. Because you got Washington, John Adams, Jefferson, James Madison, and then James Monroe. Back to back. Okay. Back to back, James. Five you should be able to do. After that gets a little tricky. Then you got John Quincy Adams at number six, Andrew Jackson, seven, and then Martin Van Buren, eight. Martin Van Buren, I think I feel like he gets lost in the. He, well, he's all, he's also uh, referenced in a in an episode of Seinfeld with the Van Buren boys, so that's why you most people know Van Buren's eight. Yeah, but there we go, James Madison, he, number I don't four. Think he gets the credit he deserves. He might not. Good old MVB. I, I hope, um, by the way, I hope he wasn't a slave owner or something. I have so I apologize. Uh, I'm I'm not going to say yes or no. I don't know, but uh, the probabilities uh, probably are not in his favor. Um, <laughs> you know, nor are they for James Madison, to be honest here. Uh, yeah, he's born into a slave owning family. That's a tough thing. I was going to just sort of. Well, it's over it's, that. it's 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 not as tough as the other side of it, GP. That's so. You, yeah. Fair point. Fair yeah. point. So let's not let's th not throw too many sympathies <laughs> on James Madison. Okay, for being born into a slave owning family. Okay. 
It could have been on the other side of it. Yeah, it's that's all I'll say. George Washington has a new university named after him. Thomas Jefferson, essentially, the University of Virginia is 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 in his honor and image, I guess. James Madison has one. Uh, anyone? Is there a John Adams University? I don't know. Uh, we had Trump University. Okay, <laughs> that was kind of hey, that was wild. Hey, the one thing that I did learn mm. that I did not, I genuinely didn't know this. Is that Madison Square Garden is named after James Madison? Did you know that? Did you know that Madison Square Garden ain't even where it used to be? Yes, I did. Uh, they moved it like three times. Yes, I'm aware of that. <laughs> they just keep moving. We brought that up on the podcast before. <laughs> what if we did that with everything? Like, what if we just move the Statue of Liberty around too? <laughs> Wouldn't that be wild? Well, it did move, didn't it? I don't know. Didn't it, yeah, it came over from? Didn't well, of course. Well, like, yeah, they didn't build it just south of Manhattan. Oh, <laughs> of course, it had to move from one place to another. Hold on. I thought the statue, of, yeah, uh, it, yeah, it moved. Didn't the statue ever move? Hold on, I thought it I did. I thought it moved from. Uh, I think we should. I move thought it was it on Ellis Island. I might be wrong on that. We should move it again. Like, let's not. Where would we move it now? I guess it, it actually looks at this. Close to Texas, I think probably. Believers in the Mandela effect think that the Statue of Liberty was on Ellis Island in another timeline. I'm, I'm, I'm suffering from the Mandela effect again. <laughs> wow. Is okay, it? should we talk to basketball team? I was wondering, on James I was wondering if you wanted to. I, I am, I am. Hey, ready. In all seriousness, like, yes. restart. I know you talked to Preston Spradlin this morning. I did. What'd you learn? I learned a ton. Um, first and foremost, he just went on a. He got a date night in last night. Caught okay. Beetlejuice review from him. Just okay. I want to see it. Movie. I want to see it. I love the. I first told him to us. Like, I actually, I really like Beetlejuice growing up, and uh, we'll get to it eventually. But he said, just okay. Hmm. Um. Uh, otherwise, okay, Preston Spradlin, if you're a JMU fan listening, you probably have a decent read on him. If you're a casual listening, well, we hope you've enjoyed this show so far. Um, he got this job in semi unexpected circumstances. So, uh, he did tell me that for everything he loved about his job at Moorhead State, obviously it's, it's, that would be fairly defined as a low major job. Um, there are always four mid majors, uh, that he had, you know, had his eye on if ever there was something that came up. And it just so happened that three of them opened in the same cycle, Western Kentucky, Charleston, and then JMU. I didn't ask him for the fourth. He didn't offer what the fourth mid-major was, uh, but no shortage of obviously intriguing ones that could be. And how this all went down was obviously JMU makes the tournament. I was there. I covered him. Mark Byington, they win. They beat Wisconsin uh, and have one of the most impressive wins in the first round of the tournament. And... Then they get knocked out. I guess that would have been a Sunday. They lost to Duke. The Dukes lost to Duke. And then by Monday at, I want to say, 11 a.m., like, Byington has agreed to terms to go to and, and get the Vanderbilt job. So, um, according to JMU, and I think there's, there's a decent chance this is true, but you never know for sure. Uh, Spradlin was at the top of their list. He interviewed, I guess, would have made first contact that Monday into Tuesday. Um, he was offered the job on Wednesday privately, went and saw the campus with his family that Thursday, accepted on that Friday, and then off we go and off for running. We are talking about a university here, and he was he had mentioned uh, a lot of the benefits here. JMU is the only group of five school that last year made the NCAA tournament, made it to a bowl game, and had a baseball team in the NCAA tournament. Um, it is, and we talked about this when they were, making their big run this is a program that has a real window here longtime caa member for decades now it switches to the Sun Belt because of football it's football programs on the rise um it has an opportunity to build itself into a mid-major powerhouse and we'll see if spradlin can indeed be the guy but this this school <laughs> in the past few months lost its president to who took another job it's AD retired after more than two and a half years on the job. It's football coach went to Indiana after that, uh, after that big, uh, after that big season there, obviously Byington goes to Vandy. So it is a program on the rise, a program that rates comfortably top two, top three in the Sun Belt and basketball when it comes to NIL, which is a major factor. Spradlin told me that because of its location in there in Virginia, they've got uh recruitable access to the South, the general, you know, uh, Virginia, that that you know, the mid eastern seaboard, and then up there into the northeast. Uh, he's obviously very much loving the job so far. We can get to the roster in just a second there. Um, but he, uh, 
he called the location incredible for for where he's living, the school, access to recruits, all of that. Um, and you know, not being so far from the DMV area is obviously big. And he said we have it's a big time academic school, so you have high academic achievers. Um, but it's also the thing he mentioned a couple times. GP is he's like to me, it feels like an ACC school uh, in terms of the enthusiasm on the campus in the community. And where hey, give it five years, it might be <laughs> certainly on the table. But he made a good point. He said at Moorhead State. We had fans and it was good, but it was in Kentucky. So 90% of the people in that state, 80% of the people in that state are Kentucky fans and then, or they're Louisville fans, but they're mostly Kentucky fans. And then, uh, yeah, they can become more head state fans when they're good. That's not the case at JMU where they're, it's not like we're a Virginia fan first, Virginia tech fan second, and then JMU when it's, when it's convenient. Um, they have a dedicated, dedicated fan base, Apparently, he said top 10 party school still. I know it's had a party school reputation for a while. I'm not, I don't have my, uh, my latest, uh, my rankings on that. But, uh, but yeah, they are, they are in a very good spot and expectations continue to be very, very, very high. And they have a pretty wide alumni base as well. So uh, he does take the job under good circumstances, but also elevated standard circumstances, GP. Byington, is, that was the best season in school history, effectively, last season. So he un understandably leaves and takes a high major job at Vandy. And so now Spradlin comes in, and there's a lot of expectations. But guess what? There's only one player of, of impact that's returning to this roster. And so it, it's going to be it's going to be probably a fun year one but also in many ways a difficult year one because it's not like, you know, you've got to take something over and build it in your own image. And uh, very few pieces remain from a year ago. Yeah. Um, the leading returning score, as you mentioned, is Xavier Brown, mm -hmm. six two guard. And he only averaged 6.3 points last season and 21.1 minutes per game. The top seven scores, most notably Terrence Edwards and TJ Bickerstaff are all gone. So it's, it's a brand new team for all intents and purposes. Um, but you're exactly right. Um, he, t you know, you, you take over something that has developed as a real mid-major brand, but you are taking over at a time when, you know, they just went 32 and four. And so that's a pretty high bar. I don't think anybody is expecting or even um, asking Preston to, to touch that bar in year one. Um, but yeah, this isn't a situation where you take over a program that's been struggling and now you got to build it into something. You've got to try to maintain what has already been been done. Um, I will say, you know, the the he did seven full years at Moorhead State uh, after taking over midseason, December of 2016. So he was the head coach for parts of eight seasons, but he did seven full seasons. And in the last four, he averaged 23 and a half wins per season, made two NCAA tournaments in uh, the previous four years. And before that, um, you might know this, uh, he was on staff with John Calipari at Kentucky. He was actually a grad assistant on John's first team, the John Wall, DeMarcus Cousins, Eric Bledsoe uh, team that was ranked number one in the country and had a real shot to win a national championship. So he was on staff at UK from, I believe, 2009 to 2014 in various roles, then ends up at Moorhead State, then takes over at Moorhead State and did well enough there that it was unsurprising that he was given a better, a bigger, offered a bigger opportunity um, after that four-year run. I didn't want it to be a throwaway comment, what I said earlier. I'm not predicting. I don't want that to be the headline coming out of this thing. You know, the CBS Sports College Basketball Podcast predicts James Madison is going to be in the ACC some days. I have no idea. But that I don't mean that as a throwaway comment. Like, you keep building football. You keep building basketball. You show that you've got a real passionate fan base, people who care about what you're doing, uh, the financial support being there. And then the ACC ultimately breaks up because Clemson, Florida State, who knows who else leaves and goes wherever – and those leftover ACC teams, whatever those are, let's just call it for the sake of the conversation, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, and other schools like that, it's not crazy to me. I think we could look up in five, ten years, and James Madison is in something called the ACC with something that features current schools that are in the ACC right now. That's not crazy to me.
I, I tell you what, I mean, university leadership is obviously going to try and pave that kind of way. And it'll have to be football will have to be continuing to be dominant. I mean, this remember they had uh, they had game day on their campus okay. last season. I think it might have been the season finale or something like that. And that was the largest crowd. However, they determine those kind of things that game day had ever had. Uh, and obviously, that's been a, a long running, successful pregame football uh, television program there for decades. Um, and yeah, I mean, the school's on fire right now. Oh, by the way, uh, the late, great Leroy Moore uh, from DMB also attended JMU. So shouts to uh, the Grugux King there. They are uh, they are positioning themselves or at least attempting to to move that. Uh, move their standing within uh, college athletics ever more. Um, you know, there was actually you JMU fans listening are obviously very aware of this, but JMU got caught up in uh, controversy because they were, uh, you know, kept out of the CAA tournaments because they were leaving for the Sun Belt. Um, and by nature of moving to the Sun Belt, they, they had really good teams that were that were held back because of uh, some would say arcane rules. Some would say those rules are in place to prevent chaos when schools want to uh, leave one league for another there. And now they're in the Sun Belt, well established, and they're going to continue to try and make a uh, make a ton of noise there. And we'll see if they can in basketball. The Sun Belt, it's a quality mid-major league, but it needs to have. Uh, I think some consistency two, three, four years in a row where you've got two or three teams that are in that top 100 or near the top 100 conversation. Uh, it may well get there uh, again this season. Uh, we've got a we've got a chance at at seeing that there. But you know, he's also uh, Spradlin. We'll get to the the full roster here, but I'll also note that he has done a good job already on the recruiting trail. Uh, they've gotten a couple of of impact players, and they've got uh, they've got a commitment from one player here. I've got it in my notes. He is the highest rated player in the history of the program, um, which is frankly uh, incredible that you could take a job at a mid-major and within months secure a commitment from a four-star player and and make school history. His name is Preston Fowler. And uh, again, he's the highest rated guy to ever commit to play for JMU. They've also got a three-star player from Tennessee named Christian Brown. So he's done well on the recruiting trail. Obviously, at a spot like JMU, for as much as you want to have consistency and culture building with your roster, you're going to have to be able to navigate the portal. And with what he has and what they have from an NIL perspective, they should be um, they should be pretty decent here. Roster-wise, um, through talking with... Let me, let me, okay, let me stop you right, right here for one second, because you touched on something that... You mentioned the winning bidder was Jeff, and he yeah. had, he had sent an, uh, us a nice note, and just had some sort of like he questions he would like to hear us yes. answer. And one of the, he noted that um, they already have two commitments, class of two thousand twenty five. One of whom is the highest rated recruit in JMU history. I don't know if he framed it that way, but if you're framing it that way, I accept it as fact. Uh, Preston told me that was the case. So okay, I'm- good. What Jeff wondered, and I think he's right, is like. And I'm not trying to take anything away from what Preston did. Like you, you said, it's incredible, and I agree. I do think it's reasonable to point out: is it a sign of the times? Meaning, wherever this young man is ranked, he's a four-star prospect. That type of player, especially early in a different era, would never, or at least rarely, commit to James Madison or a school at that level this early. So the question becomes, how does why is it happening now? Is the answer because the high major offers that used to come every summer and fall, they're not coming the way they used to. In other words, if every high major program used to offer, try to sign five high school kids early, and they didn't, but just play along. Now it's more like two or three. So mm-hmm. you take every high major program and say they used to offer five high school kids every year on average, let's just say. Now they're offering two or three on average. That means the total number of high major offers that are out there right now, they're just, it's lower, way lower probably than it's ever been because coaches are holding scholarships waiting for the transfer portal to open uh, next year. So they, rather than use those high school, those scholarships on high school players, you use them on more experienced, uh, more impactful transfers. So guys like this are like, you're sitting around and you're waiting for a Syracuse or an Indiana or a Mississippi state to call Mm -hmm. because they used to call people like you. And offer people like you. But right now, they're like, no, we're going to take two better high school prospects. And we'll hold these other scholarships for transfers. And four-star prospects who used to get high major offers aren't getting them anymore. Is that an explanation for what happened? I think it tracks. Um, Obviously, a lot of these things can be circumstantial. But I do think that – I do, GP, I do think that tracks. And I do believe – 
although you could get a guy for one year and then he's just gone, right? Um, it probably can be for the benefit of the sport if this is the case where you have, let's just call it, let's call it guys in the 50 to 100 range maybe or 75 to 100 range. And if they wind up going to non-conventional places or going to mid-majors and they develop there, and even if they're gone after two years, if they can be truly impactful and can take a mid-major program and change them from being the fourth best team in their league to the first or second best team in the league and getting into the tournament and having that kind of natural talent and being a difference maker, being a playmaker, uh, I actually think that has really good impacts, potential impacts on the sport when most people are watching and you have okay. mid-majors that have that kind of talent. So, uh, yes, it, it very well feels like it could be uh, a, sit a situation where the current climate is leading itself to be more likely that we get these kind of players in here and there. But I don't, I don't personally view that as negative. No, I don't either. And yeah. in fact, um, I, I would argue like if I were the parent of a prospect who's ranked 75th or 135th or whatever, you know, in that range, rather than go be, and I've made this point before, rather than go be the fourth best player in Auburn's class or UCLA's class where you're almost certainly buried on the bench as a freshman and also you don't have much value coming out of high school from an NIL perspective like, you, like these schools are throwing around money now but like if you're ranked 135th in the country you know you'll get something but it ain't gonna be crazy money I don't think um here's what I would do if I were the parent of a player like that I would go to somewhere like James Madison. I would go, I'd go somewhere where I say, we are going to be a starter in year one, most talented guy on campus or one of them and have a real role as a freshman. And then you know what I'd do? Go out and average 15 points a game, first team Sunbelt, immediately hop in the transfer portal and let Arkansas buy me for $1.5 million. Rather than, because what's the alternative to that? Go to Arkansas at a high school as the fourth or fifth best prospect in the class. You're buried on the bench. You have no v additional value heading into your sophomore year. They're just like, well, what are you going to do? You're probably going to transfer out of there. But if you go average 15 points per game at the mid-major level, you know what they do? They get the bidding war starts for, on you. And yeah. I'm talking millions of dollars. That, that, to me, is the recipe for success now if you're trying to maximize your value. If you can't be one of the best freshmen on a high-major college basketball team and, by extension, one of the best players, go to a mid-major, ball out, get in a transfer portal, then go high major and make a million bucks. You, can, I mean, th that pathway is, is there. And then Jeff had mentioned, he said, well, mid-majors be, you know, become the, the JV equivalent to power schools. Uh, you know, you train the players and they go, yes and no, it does flow both ways. Right. So you do have the, obviously, we've talked about this so many times on the show, but you do have the players that, that want to be on the, that want to get the high major offer and their dreams might be outsized when they get there. And then they, they live in, they exist there for one or two years, really one year, the way it's been going as of late. And then they realize it's not going to happen for them. Some will still try and make it happen. Another high major, but some understand where they're at and their development and dropping down a level can really benefit them. And so high and so low majors or mid majors can also benefit from that as well. Uh, the pathway you're suggesting there can be a very, very fruitful one for basketball players in particular. Uh, I might even argue more than on the football side where th there's a lot of NIL money in football right now, but there's more players to spread it out with. Obviously, basketball, uh, the roster numbers aren't nearly as big. And if you can be a truly impactful player and you can have a certain level of uh, pragmatism about it, which is hard to say, you know, uh, completely understandable at 17 or 18 why you wouldn't have that. Um, but if you can see the bigger picture, uh, there is uh, this is not an exaggeration. If you are the, let's just say you are the 93rd ranked player in your high school class and you have standing scholarship offers from one or two schools, I I, I would even qualify this as being at the A-10 level, okay? And you know that if you go there, you're going to get legitimate playing time and more than you would at any of the power five at the basketball level, obviously. Uh, you do that. You live up to your own expectation and come through in year one, year two. There will be opportunities for you to make hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars more as a college athlete than if you want to roll the dice, develop at a place that's a high major. Maybe it does wind up working out. I'm not saying that that route can't work for you, but the other way around, actually, you know, <laughs> we we have just seen and heard too many stories in the past two, three years, GP, of 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 how this is now going. So it's something to obviously uh, to keep in mind there. Uh, yeah, like, like if you're James uh, Madison, so you sign a four-star prospect, class of 2025. If he becomes what it is you hope he can become, you will likely lose him, right? 
that's I mean, maybe not. I don't I don't even know the young man. He might have grown up just loving James Madison and like yeah. he spends as much time on the Wikipedia page as I do. So maybe he's there for like four years. But odds are at the mid major level, you're gonna lose your best players to the transfer portal to NIL money from power four schools or big East schools, but it works both ways. You know who you're going to get and see it's happening, not just around the country. It's happening at James Madison right now. They bring in Justin Taylor from Syracuse. They bring in Elijah Hutchins Everett from Seton Hall. So it's, 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 it, you're going to enroll players, freshmen. They're going to be good. They're going to leave you, but coming back through the door, is going to be people who went high major out of high school, got there, realized they don't like playing seven minutes a game, and so they're going to come back down to the sunbutt level, and it'll all balance out just fine. Uh, let's get to the rest of the questions that Jeff sent here. As promised on previous uh, auction promos, uh, the winning bid got to uh, help uh, program the show just a little bit here. So he said, can the sunbelt become a multi-bid league for the tournament? I... I Obviously interested in your thoughts, GP, because we might differ a little bit here, or maybe we don't. Uh, I I would say it's a narrow chance, but I I don't think this is impossible. You know, App State under Dustin Kearns was really really solid last year. You've got Arkansas State, who's who's got a chance. This it's going to be the league favorite. It will have a chance at being a 30 win team in the regular season. And if you, you have to have the right breaks, you have to have two or three really, really good teams at the top that basically only lose one or two league games and they only lose them to each other. The Sun Belt could get there, but you've got to have that kind of disparity and, and dodge every single conceivable Q3 and Q4 landmine in the league. It's not likely, but I don't put it at zero. I mean, in the next three years, I'd say there's a, with the current coaches in the league, like I'd say there's a 5% chance, maybe a 4% chance that the Sun Belt could be a multi-bid league. Not impossible. We've seen mid-major leagues do it, and the Sun Belt seems to be on the rise. Unlikely. Certainly not 0% chance because, like, it's possible. Anything that's possible, you can't put a 0. Um, so it's above 0, but it's not great. It would take exactly what you laid out. A team, let's just do it like this. A team as good as James Madison was last season, mm -hmm. which, by the way, did you realize this? I mentioned they lost their top seven scores. Did you realize all seven scores, top seven scores, played all 36 games? I where, didn't realize that, but that's do you wait, like that's blessed, right? There. Where that is blessed. That's blessed. Where else did that happen? That cannot, that's got to be wildly unusual to have a college basketball team play 36 games, as many as 36 top, games, and get all seven. And top seven players played it, appeared in all 36 games. So, buddy, they were as healthy as anybody in the country last year. Um, so it would take somebody being as good as that team, and then that team losing in the championship game of the Sub tournament. The automatic bid goes to somebody else. The team as good as James Madison gets an at-large bid as a 12 seed or whatever, 11. It, it, it's hard to do. It it's almost has to be perfect, and I, I'd bet against it every year, and I'd be right way more often than I'm wrong, but I'd be happy to be wrong some year, someday. Jeff also asked, what can mid-majors do to get Power 4 teams to schedule them? Um, they JMU has not a released a schedule as of yet, but I think it's actually supposed to come this week, coincidentally enough, but Preston gave me the schedule, so we'll get to that in just a second. Um, I'm like, I'm half joking, half serious, but more serious than joking here. You need either blackmail or guilt trip your friends in the profession to do it. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. that's unfortunately pretty much it. What was surprising to me was how uh, Preston told me that he called essentially every high major only got one to play them. I'll reveal that in just a minute here. Uh, with such a big roster turnover and a new coaching staff. Now, Preston has a really good reputation as a coach. He's a really, really good young coach. And they've also, they've not that the high majors would come there, but they've got a building that's like less than five years old that's just apparently incredible. Just an amazing mid-major facility. So they have so much going for them in terms of momentum there. Um, I thought he would be able to maybe have a little bit more success and maybe get a second uh, high major in there. I don't know if they would need a buy game situation or not, but that was not the case whatsoever. But I'm not kidding, man. You asked, like, I understand if you're a, if you're a fan of a mid-major program and that and it's it's not one of the three or four most prominent ones in the sport. Why can't we get more games against even the low end high majors? Uh, they're just not too many coaches are afraid. And so you need a, a longstanding friendship in the profession and someone that uh, literally a guy who will do you a solid or you got to have blackmail material. That's it. <laughs> I uh, wrote a column about this a, a long time ago. I guess it was when Porter Moser was still at Loyola mm -hmm. and I wrote it. I just used him as a device to frame the column. 
like what I was writing had nothing to do with Loyola. It was like, this is something I want to say, and he's my hook. But he had said something like, you know, coming off the Final Four, they couldn't get anybody to play him. And he was just like, I, you know, I can't get home and homes. And I'm like, you, you, you're right. You can't. So stop trying. Like, if you want these games, you got to go play them wherever they'll play you. And because the truth is, you're at this level, you're not, you're just not going to get home and homes with high major programs unless, you know, Tony Bennett wants to do you a favor or one of your friends in the business wants to do you a favor, but that's what it is. And so if you want to play big time opponents to try to build an at-large resume, my advice to mid-major coaches has for a while been stop complaining about nobody will play me home and home. And I'm not suggesting that's what Preston was doing. I'm just saying, I hear this all the time. Can't get a game. Well, you're never going to get that. It's like me saying, I, I can't get a rocket ship. Well, you know, I'm not going to get a rocket ship. So stop talking about it. Yeah, but and you're like, not in the rocket ship business. Continue. Just, just, just talk about things that are realistic and stop complaining about things that don't, that are never going to be realistic for you. So if you think you've got a team that's good enough to compete for an at-large resume, to, to compete for an at-large bid in a mid-major conference, you, sure, call all your buddies and see if you can get a home and home. You'd love to get a big brand in your building. But if that won't work, and you can't get the big multi-team events because, like, you know, Maui ain't inviting you. Atlantis ain't inviting you. Um, you just Then you just start going, hey, we'll take a check from you. We'll come to your place, and, you know, you'll be a favorite, but we'll, we'll, we'll give you our best shot. And even then, if you're good, a lot of them will just pass. They'll just say, nah, we're not bringing – you know, we'll bring in somebody in the 300s, not you. But that's the way you got to get the games. you got to go get them wherever you can get them and not really complain about it because the truth is all these mid-major coaches who complain about it, when they become high major coaches, you know what they do? The exact same thing the high major coaches were doing to them. They Porter, and I'm not speaking to Porter, but like the mid major coaches go, nobody will play us and it's effed up. And then they become high major coaches and they're like, I'm not playing those guys. It's the same thing. Yeah, there are occasional exceptions, but what you're speaking yes. about is generally the role. Uh, last question here because he asked another one we, we addressed it earlier. Jeff wants to know what would you consider success for JMU in 24 25? I'll be quick here. Uh, to me, I look at the situation first year co coach. Really, really good job in the portal era. Success is the key word. I would say success for JMU in year one is third at worst in the league. A semi-finals appearance in the Sunbelt Conference Tournament, and then you take anything after that. Mm -hmm. I would say sixth or worse in the Sunbelt, and no postseason wins would be an outright failure. But I think your bar here for success in year one, new roster, is probably third in the standings, and get yourself to the semis. That's how I would define it. Yeah, like we mentioned at Torvik in the preseason, they're 123. So whether it's Torvik, Ken Palm, any of these uh, sides, you know, can you can you finish in the top 100 to continue to say, hey, we're a top 100 program in America, top three in our league. And then the league tournament is just, you know, it is what it is. It's, it's a single elimination tournament of 40-minute games. And if, uh, you know, you play well enough and you're good enough, you'll get to the NCAA tournament. And if not, you won't. And uh, sometimes just being good enough and playing well enough isn't, isn't good enough if you just get, you know, some bad breaks on the other side. So it, it, it's much more difficult to talk about what success looks like at the mid-major level than it is at the high-major level. Because at the high-major level, you have – a lot of opportunities to prove how good you are and a lot of opportunities to to do the things that you need to do to get where you want to get at the mid-major level you don't have that many opportunities and if you slip up here or there it can ruin the whole thing like you can el be eliminated from the at-large conversation by by december 15th at the mid-major level if not earlier and obviously earlier so it's just it's tough but i'm not going to pretend to be a sunbelt expert uh, but I sure wish you would they did bring in you know high major transfers he brought mark freeman with him from moorhead state mm -hmm. that's a 511 guard my little homie from memphis ovc player of the year two years ago south wind high graduate there we go missed all of last season with an injury but before yeah. that averaged 15 points per game 3.7 assists two years ago so there is some talent in the program like i you know this is what i like i really i remember the first time we had an idea to do something like this and i was like come on and as we've done it, I enjoy these because it forces me to dive in and look at things that I otherwise probably wouldn't be looking at. Right. Yep. Um, so I like, I enjoyed the prep work for this, but as I look at it, I'm like, okay, you got a guy from Syracuse, you got a guy from Seton hall, mm -hmm. you got a former conference player of the year. 
you know, there's some stuff there. I'm 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 interested to to see how it goes. Yeah, they also have a guy named Luke Anderson who was a D2 All American at Florida Southern. So uh, I think Anderson, uh, Eddie Ricks from Moorhead came along with them. Mark Freeman came along with them. They'll be in the mix to start. Xavier Brown will start, and then Ebenezer Dewana from Georgia Tech or Elijah Hutchins Everett from Seton Hall probably in the mix to uh, start the I big love there. Man, Ebenezer, we don't have enough I know. Ebenezer. I the same we don't have enough there. Ebenezer. I I I completely agree. I absolutely love it. And then the guys you mentioned, I'll give them uh, shout outs here. Justin. Taylor is 6'6 six, six wing from Q's. Uh, Bryce Lindsay is a 6'3 guard from Texas A&M. And then Noah Williams, 6'5 guard from Washington, comes over. You've got, again, sometimes it flows back to you. The mm-hmm. high majors that come back down a level. We'll see. They've got, I, I do think they've got a really good chance of being a top 125 team. But who knows? We'll, we'll have to see on uh, on how that goes. He also, Jeff, wanted to know, this is so funny. It, it, it's uh, the latest reminder that uh, we've got some really awesome OG listeners who've been checking in with this pod for over a decade at this point we love you but the the show and thankfully this is what we want it does add listenership uh pretty much by the month um and he said uh my dad played high school in chester south carolina and was a star on the team in the 50s he later taught and coached ralph sampson in harrisonburg virginia which is a really awesome note um he said, I'm curious why Gary Parrish shouts out Chester, South Carolina. Now, if you are a regular listener to this show, you are all too aware, and this has been explained a half dozen times over the years. But uh, one more time, Jeff, your alma mater, and you guys, you got this done on the auction bid, so we're going to answer this question. GP, what's the origin of the shouts to Chester, South Carolina at the end of every episode? Chester, South Carolina, obviously, is uh, the home of Devin Downey, That's uh, right. former South Carolina guard, who, ready to wrap all this together? Let's do it. Handed John Calipari his first ever loss at Kentucky while oh, that stuff. <laughs> while Preston Spradlin was sitting there on the bench. How about that? Preston Spradlin saw that in person. I'm assuming. Yeah, I'm, I should have brought it up to him. I did not. I didn't. Uh, he was I a didn't graduate really assistant. So, that, so one time, the way this is the way the thing works. I'll be shouting out James Madison and Dolly Madison and Dolly. I bet you didn't even know about Dolly. Didn't no. Didn't I'll be didn't. shouting out James. I could end up shouting out Dolly Madison every that, podcast uh, based on nothing that, more than this. Is that the wife? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She had it tough, man. Yeah. You want to, you want to, you want to do a, another detour here and just okay, go. Okay. Hold on. Just, okay. So let me rephrase it. So we, we're talking about John Calipari in Kentucky because that's, we do that a lot. If you, if you're just joining us, we do that a lot. And uh, we started uh, remembering the Devin Downey game and it came up again somehow. And next thing you know, I was just shouting out Devin Downey and then it was shouting out Chester, South Carolina and, Yep. The rest, as they say, is uh, history. But back to Dolly. You don't know about Dolly Madison. Nope. James was her second husband. Okay. I didn't know they did this kind of stuff back in, you know, the 1800s or whatever. But uh, James was her second husband. And the reason she was available for mm-hmm. James is because her first husband died in 1793. Yellow fever epidemic that that also, in addition to her husband, took oh. out her son, mother-in-law oh. and father-in-law. Gosh. Yellow fever epidemic ain't no joke, man. Was there a was there a Gary Parish in 1793 walking around saying this is the dumbest yellow fever I've ever seen in my lifetime? It was just a crazy time, you know? I mean, she lost her yeah. husband, son, father-in-law, and brother-in-law, and then two yeah. brothers, I think, died a couple years later. A lot of death that Dolly was dealing with, and reportedly, what I gather, she never fully recovered from that. But she did end up meeting James Madison. You know who introduced him? You ain't gonna believe this. Guess who played? Who introduced you and your wife? Uh, no one. Um, we don't need to get totally <laughs> autobiographical on this. Uh, I was uh, I was working at the student newspaper, and the first time we ever met, she walked in uh, and was interested in joining the paper. So that's how we uh, that's how we met. How about that? Yep. So K- Casey, my friend Casey, introduced me to my wife. She is the person who introduced. She said, "I think there's somebody. I I, I think you'd like a friend of mine." And she told. My wife, I think you'd like a friend of mine. And she introduced us and, and uh, you know, then we ended up, you know, we kissed at some point. Okay. And then, you, you know how it works. Keep it going. All right. So guess who introduced James and Dolly? I, I, it wasn't I, Casey. You know who it George, was? I'm going to say George Washington. Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr. Aaron Burr was the matchmaker. He said, Dolly, you need to meet James. He, he, he made some... Good decisions and some not so good decisions. <laughs> you know, Aaron Burr is complicated, complicated fella. So he introduces Dolly to James, undeterred by their. Uh, are we sure about this, by the way? 
I mean, I guess we trust. I, I assume this is a historical record. So it's a historical record. Yeah. It's, it's in uh, Wikipedia. must be true. Norland, let me educate you on James and Dolly. Aaron Burr introduces him, and he's not bothered by the age gap. There's an age gap here. Oh, my God. Trivia time. <laughs> Trivia time. How Trivia. much older was James than uh, Dolly? I'm going to Oh, God. Um... <laughs> It's not. It's not like I'm gonna say. It's not I'm like gonna Robert say, back. I'm gonna say 17 years. Holy shit! 17 years. Oh! When they got married, I believe he was 43 oh. and she was 26. I was scared That's it was cool. gonna be. I was scared it was gonna be like, like you know, 34 and 17. Wait, how old was she? 43. He was 43. I think she was 26. Okay, got it. Okay. I don't. I'm not bothered by 43 and 26. Are you? I keep it moving. I don't think that bothers me nearly as much. Leo would do it. I mean, probably not the 26, but Leo would do 43 and 20. Well, no problem. 40. Here's another one. Trivia time. Trivia time. <laughs> yeah. How tall was James Madison? Um, J- well, uh, Founding father. I feel like if he had gone by United Jimmy, States. he would have been sh- I don't, I, That's a good question. Father of our Constitution. He is yes, regarded as the father of the our And the Bill of Rights. How tall do you think Hold he on, was? I, I, I'm by no means. I'm not. I'm not saying I I cruised with A's across the board going through history classes in high school and stuff. But like, did you? Were you? I I I assume you were aware that James Madison was one of the most important people connected to our Constitution and Bill of Rights. Did you know that before you dove into this? I knew he. I knew he played a role. <laughs> did you? <laughs> Stop. I'm gonna say. Or are you taller than Jimmy Jimmy Madison? I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm gonna say your same height, five four. I would. Whoa, ho, hold up. First off, I'm not five four. All right, I'm also not five eight, and I think I might be shrinking. I think I'm shrinking as I get older. But I'm a legit five seven. I would post James Madison. Of all, that's not a real thing. A legit five seven. You never you never follow up with I'm a legit with five seven. Well, you just call he's a legit four. seven footer. Oh, he he's a, he's a legit six ten wing. No one says he's a legit five seven. That doesn't happen. I just said it. I'm legit five seven. Okay, I'm legit five seven. All right. I think I'm shrinking. You know, we talking in ten years. I might be five six, but right now I'm a legit five seven. Okay. I think I'm shrinking though. Don't tell me he was five four. That's also a guess. James Madison was five foot four. That's the height of my wife. There we go. Guess how tall Dolly was. Give me, uh, let's root for the sickos here. Give me, give me five eleven all day. <laughs> I wish she wasn't. She's five seven though. She just like me. All right, there we she, go. Dolly, Dolly Madison and I had had some things in common. Most notably, that we were both five legitimate five mm. foot seven. So he's three inches shorter than his wife. You got any issue yeah. with that? Could you be married to a woman taller than you? I could, but I'm six three. So uh, you'd have to marry. Forward. You'd have to marry Angel Reese. Yeah. Okay. You, wouldn't that have been hilarious if you married Angel Reese? It would not. Keep it moving. They both lived to their 80s. Isn't that wild? That's Dolly's impressive. Whole, Dolly's whole family was gone in the yellow fever epidemic. Somehow she survived it. She died at 81 in, 19, in 1849, and he died at 85 in 1836. I think two couples both making it to 80, uh, two people in a couple both making it to 81 in the 1800s. That's got to be like a. Uh, That's like 105 and. In- in 2024. I mean, that's like, it's impressive. That is impressive. I'm proud of them for that's doing that. Stuff. And I'm, and I'm proud that you can get off a lot of your Wikipedia research on this episode before we got out of here. I know you would, we still have to get to the regular season over under. Oh God. Yeah. And then we can get I thought for sure that was time to go. That's not, no, 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 no. <laughs> we have done 50 minutes on James Madison. <laughs> well, we, we've done 50 minutes on James Madison and James Madison university. Okay. Mm. Um, here is your, here's the scoop. If you've been dying for that non-conference <laughs> schedule for JMU basketball, you came to the right place here. Um, okay. They did not inherit a single game this season, according to Spradlin. Uh, he said he went to pretty much every high major and he got no's from every school except one. They will open up the season in the Sunbelt Mac Challenge, which GP obviously is very familiar with, mm-hmm. against Ohio. Now that's going to be at home for JMU and yet another indication of what JMU's reputation is going into the season um, they basically pull all the coaches in both leagues and say, all right, give us your, give us your ranking top to bottom. And then we're going to try and put teams that are closely rated and Ohio might be the best team in the Mac. So JMU gets the game on its home floor, but it's going to play a really good Ohio team under Jeff Bowles. They're going to play George Mason at home on black Friday, which will be a good game to, uh, to get in their, uh, to get in their home venue. They'll be home against East Tennessee state home against Utah Valley 
They're going to play a, uh, a three-team uh, MTE in Daytona Beach. Again, so LaSalle, U- UIC, and there's another school in there. All mid-majors. The one high major after Thanksgiving at Wake Forest. Shouts to Steve Forbes. They play at Towson, who might be a top 10 mid-major in the country this season. At Norfolk State, uh, really good coach in Robert Jones. So they've got some legitimate road contests there. And then they've got two games that are to be determined. Um, they're going to play. Uh, they got a, uh, They got the Matt Challenge in February, the second, the back half of it. So they got to figure out who that's going to be. That'll be determined once the uh, once the season's going. So they have the, all that plus an 18, 18 game schedule in the Sun Belt. I'm going to set this over under the last one of the summer shoot around, by the way, if you're just coming around, we try and predict what the win total will be just for the regular season, not counting any postseason play. I'm going to set it at 18.5 wins in year one for Preston Spratlin. Okay. And I know there's no chance you go under here. I would never go under. Of course not. Not James Madison was a little fella though. I'll tell you that he's a little guy. Mm. Um, Okay. Third place, that's where Bart Torvik has him in the Sun Belt. Last season, third place in the Sun Belt was a 13 and 5 record. So, just for the sake of the conversation, let's call it 13 and 5. All right. Mm-hmm. They finished third, 13 and 5 in the league. So, that's five losses. Yeah, let's give them a loss at Wake. Wake should be good. Yes. Hunter Tallis back. It'd be a tournament team. It should be, yes. Let's give them a loss there. How many more non-league losses do you want to give them, you think? It's, it's, I've already just made my decision. Remember, they're at Towson, at Norfolk State. they got to play Ohio. i play George Mason. Let's do a total of three non-league losses, five league losses. Jeez. Is that two? That's not... I mean, no. By all means, you got them as an eight-loss team. This would okay. be phenomenal in year one for Preston Spratlin. So 31 minus eight. Let's put it at 23. Is that 23? That's 23. <laughs> okay, then. We're going 23. I'm a believer. I believe in the Dukes. I got to stand united with my other little fellas. It's 23 and 8. Well over. I am also going over. I'll say 19 and 12 in year one. Yeah, I'm, I realize it's I might have been ambitious, but I want to believe. Okay. I want to okay. believe. Hey, I appreciate a mid-major fan base stepping up here. The winners of this, by the way, in our, in our short history of doing this, Bellarmine, mm-hmm. Arizona State, yeah. Oklahoma, and now James Madison. And and would you tell we auction it off and the proceeds go to St. Jude Children's Research Hospital, That's right? Right here in Memphis, Tennessee, home of myself and uh, oh. great Elvis Aaron Presley <laughs> and uh, my little homie, Mark Freeman. There we go. How about it's all too perfect, by the way, that our one special bonus episode is by far, by the, far we, the longest. We just spent more time on James Madison than we, were we like did. 32 talking. minutes on the reigning two time champions. <laughs> yeah, we were like UConn. We're like, yeah, UConn was great last year. They'll probably be really good again. Uh, could you believe Dan Hurley turned down the Lakers? All right. Uh, we'll talk to you next time. 52 minutes on James Madison. Who is the second president of the United States? John Adams. There we go. Where's also, John, where's John I'm, Quincy Adams following that? What number? John Johnny, Quincy? John, John Quincy. Johnny Q. I mentioned him. Yeah, John Quincy. He was five. He was six. Six. Monroe's John five. Adams went on, people don't know this, went on to have a successful uh, college officiating career. He did. <laughs> he did. Look it up. If you don't believe me, Google it. Google it. Same guy. Crazy. That Crazy. is absolutely a show. Shouts to Devin Downey. Shouts to Chester, South Carolina. Shouts to Terry Teagle. He's a legend. Shouts to Huck. Larnell. Shouts to Jeff's dad, star of Chester, How South Carolina. That? Coach, How about that? Coach Ralph Samson? Samson? How about that? Talk. How about that? That's good stuff right there. All right. All right. If you're not subscribed, please go subscribe anywhere you subscribe to podcasts, Apple, Spotify. More of us than there are of them. That should be reflected in the comments. So do that, and we'll talk to you again real soon. Till then, take care.